My name is Rahayo Mejia. I'm an assistant professor of infectious diseases and pediatrics here at the National School of Tropical Medicine, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. I went to the University of Michigan, Dearborn, and I majored in biochemistry and chemistry. And that's what interested me in medicine. I went then to Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, where I received my medical degree. I then did my internal medicine residency at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and then went on to do my infectious disease fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases. I am a clinician and serve on the Infectious Disease Consult Service at Ben Taub Public Hospital. I'm also a attending at the Tropical Medicine Clinic here at Baylor, which is a unique clinic in that we are one of the only tropical medicine clinics in the United States and we deal with patients ranging from neurocystocercosis, malaria, disseminated mycobacterium, strongyloides, and chagas. Another component of my responsibilities is as a professor of the National School of Tropical Medicine. The National School of Tropical Medicine is the first school in the United States that is solely dedicated in the education, research, and clinical practice of tropical medicine diseases. Some of the subjects we teach include parasitology such as helminths, ascaris, strongyloides, hookworm, protozoa including giardia, entomoeba histolytica, but we also teach nutritional aspects in resource limited countries. We delve into public health and policy issues we look at HIV as it affects the tropical population. Finally, I am also an investigator focusing on diagnostics of helminths and protozoa and their morbidity in children. We have a new journal that is published by Springer. It's called the Current Tropical Medicine Reports. And it focuses on two diseases in tropical medicine every quarter. So we've had issues on Toxocara, we've had issues on dengue, chikungunya, we're continuing into strongylodiasis, malaria. So my role at the current Tropical Medicine Report is as associate editor. I help with selecting section editors, writing manuscripts, screening for relevant papers, Currently, we're very excited about our new project, which is working on the intestinal microbiome in children with and without parasites. It hasn't been looked at thoroughly, and we have collaborations and cohorts in Ecuador and Argentina with samples of children from birth to five years old. So we're going to be able to compare what happens having a parasite and not having a parasite to the microbiota in each individual child. Then we'll be able to go back and say, does this change growth development in, in these individuals? Two children that we ran the microbiome sequencing from uh, the GI tract. And on the left, you can see the diagram showing very little diversity. And that's the thing about the microbiome. The more diversity usually means better health. So on the left you have large sections of single individual organisms such as Provotella with parasites. And if you compare that to the child without parasites, you have a lot more biodiversity, usually meaning better health. So in this heat map, the first two lanes are children with no parasites and the second two lanes are children with giardia. If you have a very yellow color it means high intensity of that bacteria and then black means very little to none. And right away you can see on the left you have a lot more diversity 
compared to the right that children have with Giardia. These large areas without any bacteria usually means more disease processes. Another project that I'm excited about is describing what immunological changes occur in a patient with different type of parasites. A patient that has a helminth infection has mostly a Th2 response, while protozoa elicit more of a Th1. There is some evidence that having co-infection or polyparasitism alters the host immune response and thus increasing parasite burden of one of the other parasites. So this is my immunology data in our Ecuadorian cohort. Uh, these are three-year-old children with two groups, one with Giardia only and the other one with Askerson Giardia diagnosed with real-time PCR. The hypothesis is that having an Askers infection increases your Th2 response and decreases your Th1, which is an IL-2, one of the cytokines in Th1, and will increase your Giardia burden. Here's a Th1 TNF-alpha cytokine assay, and you can see that having both Askers and Giardia decrease your Th1 decrease your TNF-alpha uh, in serum. Another project that we're close to finishing is associating growth delays in children with parasitosis. So the understanding is that having gastrointestinal parasites decrease your growth compared to children that don't have parasites. There have been some recent studies that show there is no effect. Now all those studies have been done using microscopy, which is not as sensitive as our PCR. So we have already collected samples from birth every six months up to five years old in our rural Ecuadorian cohort and have done PCR on all of them. We will then collect all that data and then map out their growth percentages and associate growth delays to parasitosis. And using the WHO Anthro software, we're able to calculate for children in Ecuador in one-year-olds the length to age percentage. And you can see that in the children who had no parasites, and this is a 400 patient cohort, they had a length to age ratio about 20 percent and children that had two or more parasites diagnosed with real-time PCR diagnosed by real-time PCR you can see that their percentage of growth was statistically significantly less than the patients without no parasites these are children who have the same socioeconomic level in these villages in Ecuador so it's not feeding or malnutrition. It's not diet that's altering these numbers. Here's the z-score that uh, compares growth curves and you can see that the children with no parasites had a much less decrease in z-score than the children with polyparasitism. We also found that head circumference to age percentage was also significant in the one-year-olds comparing parasites to no parasites and then also in the z-score in the 13 months old you can see that the head circumference to age z-scores which much less decrease in the no parasite group to the polyparasitic group this is showing that there is an association with having parasites and growth delays in children in resource limited countries so some of my clinical responsibilities uh, include taking care of tropical diseases throughout the world and this lady was traveling through Ecuador where she um, received a bite from a sandfly and you can see the classic rolled bordered lesion of Leishmania. This particular species uh, was Leishmania guaiensis. 
you can see the classic ulcerative lesion with rolled borders and the severity of swelling that her thumb was undergoing. Here's a touch prep from her hand and you can see the macrophage with the vacuoles and the amastigotes seen inside the macrophage. Here's a pathological stain with the amastigote and kinetoplast in the vacuole. Here's a video of the Leishmania promastigote swimming in culture and a close-up of the promastigote. The more exciting part of my job as a clinician is to treat the patient and get them better. And here we are pre-treatment. Here's three days of liposomal amphotericin B. And you can see the improvement. You can see the decrease in swelling. Here's after seven doses, you're starting to get granulation tissue forming. Here's eight doses, it's starting to heal over. Six weeks from treatment, we still have a significant lesion. All the leishmania should be dead by now. We're just letting the wound heal by secondary intent. Here's three months after treatment, and then finally five months. She still has some violaceous changes, but we'll consider her healed. Other diseases we study are loa loa. Here is a serpiginous vermicular rash on someone who was traveling through Cameroon. You can see the rash here. Here is on the back of the leg. Here is a sample of blood that I took a movie of. These are all erythrocytes and there's the loa loa worm swimming through the blood. Here is the loa loa worm in the sclera of the eye. And here is the loa loa worm traveling through the sclera of the eye. So another common disease we see here in Houston and throughout the United States is neurocystic And here you see someone with a parenchymal lesion, a gentleman from El Salvador, and he had uh, an episode of right-sided paralysis, upper and lower extremity. You can see this large cystic lesion with the scolex here in the middle and the tremendous degree of inflammation on the MRI. Here is a post-contrast view. And you can see the degree of inflammation and here is the axial view with his eyes up front and this large cystic lesion. And here's the surgery. Uh, this is the cerebellum. And here is near the aqueduct of Silvis. The neurosurgeons will go behind the cyst, add some sterile fluid, and so add some sterile saline, and push out the cyst from behind. This is a very classic gelatinous neurocyst to cercosis. Here's the scolex of the tapeworm. And there's a removal of the cyst. The classic question I always get is what about if you rupture the sac? And it is concerning, but the patient is on steroids and, and albendazole an antiparasitic agent, so they should be fine. So here's our real-time PCR instrument by ABI. It has a six-color scale. Where we're able to detect up to six different parasites at one time. Here's a standard curve for our Ascaris Argentina project, where we can create a linear curve and then quantitate how much parasite is found in each patient. So we load these 96 well plates into the instrument with the samples, up to 36 samples in duplicate, and we close the machine. And in about 33 minutes, it'll give us results for 36 patients, depending on what parasite you're looking for. The one of the most important career advices I've ever received was not to remain so focused early on in my career. So if you remain more open, instead of just saying, I want to study protein 
or DNA or RNAi in malaria, you stay more open and you keep it broad. You say, I want to cover malaria and how it affects the human host. It opens up more opportunities and then you can research that more. I would recommend finding a good mentor. That is key in all fields of science because that mentor will guide you on what direction to go next. He or she will let you know what grants are available, who to speak to, what collaborators do you need to speak to, what projects should you go. Mentors are great for narrowing your focus because when we're first starting out, we have these great ideas. We want to be able to test everything. We want to be able to cure all the world's problems. And mentors rein you back in, but still allow a certain amount of freedom for you to grow. To form collaborations. Because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are other people working on similar projects or other fields of interest that can help you with your project. So if you form a network of collaborations and friends and colleagues, you'll find that you'll be able to progress and push the boundaries of science further.